This is the Dose of Support podcast. Here, the interdisciplinary team in healthcare matters, and we share stories and self-care every Wednesday. Let's break down barriers between professions. I'm Dr. Vanessa Casper, a nurse practitioner, and I'm your host. Are you ready for a dose of support? Dose of support, the host and guests are not affiliated or representing an employer or organization. Remember, I'm not your healthcare provider, and my guests are not here to provide healthcare advice either. But do seek out care from your own healthcare professional, and remember to protect privacy and follow HIPAA. It's hard out there, so let's find some self care in healthcare. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the huddle. Let's huddle up. We have a really special episode this week, and there are some big changes coming to the show, like big. And while there's still going to be an essence of stories and self care, of course, my goal is going to be explained next week during our special election episode, which I think we're all going to need some self-care that week. So um, I just want you to know that something is in the works. It will not be a regular episode next week, um, but that it, that it's going to be a good thing and we're going to see some changes moving forward. So um, this week... <laughs> Anne and I had way too much fun and we forgot to even like take a break while we were recording because we just like kept going and the conversation was so important and I just want everyone out there listening to think about patients, people as every patient is a mental health patient. Every person should have their mental health considered and As we walk through this episode, think about how important that is Um, because Anne's work in psychiatry is really underrepresented. Anyway, I'm really excited for you to hear this because we had such a good time. We talked for hours and it was really hard for me to edit it and get it down to something that was easy to listen to for you because we just had such a good time. So sit back and enjoy quite the story from Ann Hofer, nurse practitioner. Welcome back to Dose of Support. Today, my guest is a psychiatric and mental health nurse practitioner with a special concentration in perinatal psychiatry. She holds a master's degree in nursing and practices out of the great state of Nebraska. Today, she'll share a heroic story of suffering, babies, and finding help. Please welcome nurse practitioner Anne Hofer. Welcome, Anne. Hi, Vanessa. It's so great to be on your podcast. I'm so excited. That was very sing songy. Hi, Vanessa. <laughs> Um, (laughs) so I'm so glad that you're here. Anne and I go way back. So if the listeners, um, don't know either of us personally, we actually went to nursing school together. So I think we met in 2007. That sounds about right. It feels like a million years ago, but I think it's probably only about 13 actually. As another life, man. Yeah. And I just want the listeners to know that back when I met you way back in the day, you were very interested in psychiatry even back then. I remember that about you. So like this area has always been an interest, I think, for you. Absolutely. I actually worked in a halfway house for mentally ill and chemically dependent adults to put myself through nursing school because it was actually my third degree that I was pursuing at that time. So Oh my gosh, I remember that. So what is your first undergraduate degree in? So I have a bachelor's in psychology and a bachelor's degree in criminal justice that I received right before I started back into school for nursing. Gotcha. So a really diverse background there. And what made you think, huh, I need to get into healthcare, which is something I ask everyone. But for you, you had been working with vulnerable populations and you had a great background and all of a sudden you pivoted like I'm going to I'm going to be a nurse now. Yes, actually. So I was in my junior year of college, my undergraduate college. So I was about 20 or 21 years old. And I was working, I did, a, I did an internship in Washington, D.C. my junior year of college. 
and I worked at um, the psychiatric hospital in um, in Washington, D.C. And it was an interesting experience because at that point I had wanted to be a lawyer. And so I was working with the public or, yeah, the public defender's service in in Anacostia, D.C. So this was in a rough area of town. And the idea behind my internship was that we worked for the public defender service and tried to allow people to have access to a lawyer if they had been involuntarily committed to the mental hospital. So during my experience there, I actually was able to interact with the patients, interact with the nurses. And I thought to myself that these nurses looked really mad and angry, and these people looked really extremely vulnerable. And I, I kind of had this, this, you know, epiphany, I guess, that I wanted to be someone who could help people through that vulnerable time. And so during my junior year of college, I was like, yeah, I thought I was going to be a lawyer. I think now I'm going to be a nurse. And so I, I finished off my degree because I was already three years into it and decided then that I was going to go get my associate's degree in nursing as soon as I was done with college. So we're going to I, we're going to get to the regular questions that I ask people about the a day in the life of working as a psych NP. Um and we're going to get to that. And normally we tell a story at the end of our episode. But I think for for Anne, her story is a little bit different. So we're going to we're going to get into Anne's story now and and have her start kind of at the beginning of her experience. And then we'll talk about it as we go. Is that is that OK, Anne? That sounds great. All right. Pull the trigger. Let's do it. Okay, so you guys kind of heard the beginning of my story. So that that sort of sets us up for, you know, going into nursing school. And, you know, when I went into nursing school, I had always kind of thought that I wanted to do psychiatry. So when I graduated with my associates, I went and got myself a job at the um, psychiatric hospital in South Dakota and, um, you know, did that gig for a couple of years. And Throughout that time being there, I actually um, I ended up finishing my bachelor's degree while I was there and then ended up leaving and getting experience elsewhere. Um, but after I had my second child, I decided that I wanted to go into um, get my master's degree. And so this is going to go kind of backwards and forwards here, but I made the decision. I was psyched to get started with school. And so I applied, I got accepted to a college um, close to where I was living. I started the program and found out shortly after I started the program that um, they weren't yet accredited and it wasn't necessarily an issue to me. But, but when I was a year into the program is when I found out that they had actually failed accreditation. So I was not going to be able to sit for my board exam if I continued with them. So I was a and year. And so like, first of all, I want to unpack that a little because <laughs> okay. that is like money. You've paid tuition. That's a year's worth of your time and your money. And then you won't be able to sit for board exams and work afterwards if you were to continue with this program. And so how, does, how did that feel? It was devastating at the time. I mean, it was an absolute crushing blow. It was, it, it was realizing that my five-year plan was now going to be my 10-year plan. Um, you know, I had two young kids at the time, and my husband was working and helping me try to get through school. I was still working full-time through school, and we had made some really big changes in life because I was trying to accommodate school, and then this happens. And Unfortunately, it happened like in June, I think is when I figured it out. So there was no way that I could get back into school in the fall at a different program. Like into another program? Right, because everything had already been done at that point. Right. And so I that was another thing is that I, I had to sort of accept the fact that I now had to take a year off. Right. And I, just for the listeners, because I, I know this about Anne, she moves about like a million miles a minute. She is like the energizer bunny of people. Like I am a relaxed, like I, 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 I 
I don't know. I'm kind of high strung, but at the same time, I, I'm a homebody. I like to be home. I like to relax. I'm, I'm very like ambivert that way where obviously I show personality and I'm, I, I do this podcast and I work and whatever, but Anne is like, go, go, go do all the things, go to everything. Like she's so involved with her family. She's, she's in everything. So like you had the energy to go to school, to work full time, to be a mom, to be a wife, to do all the things. And then all of a sudden, and like someone stopped you from that something stopped you from doing all the things and that's got to feel like a huge roadblock it really did and honestly like I was pretty defeated for a good period of time um I wasn't actually sure whether or not I was going to go back and do my master's because at wow. this point I had done a year's worth of work on in an unaccredited program so I, I was looking at having to restart completely. Like, so I would have to go back and do all of the credits that I had already done over again. And oh. so it was, it was awful. But so I kept, I, I was working in pediatrics at the time, actually. I'd been doing pediatric home care and then I was doing pediatrics at the hospital in town. And so I'd kind of been throwing around the idea that, okay, well, I've been given this sort of pause in life. Like, so maybe this was, maybe, maybe life was trying to tell me that I wasn't moving in the right direction. Maybe I'm supposed to do pediatrics or maybe I'm supposed to do something else. And I found that it was so hard for me to get excited and get motivated to like apply to a new program in a different field. And so it was interesting because I, I had read this quote at one time that really had kind of like spoken to me. And so here I am about six months into this pause, or we'll call it. And I went to Starbucks and got a cup of coffee and written on my like Starbucks sleeve was this quote that I had, that had really kind of spoken to me before. And the, the quote was, if you can't find your purpose, follow your passion for therein lies your purpose. And it was just, it, it was a lightning bolt moment for me because I, w I realized that the reason I wasn't excited to get, at, get applying and get moving was because I, I didn't, I, I, I wasn't following my passion. I wasn't following my purpose. And I really felt at that moment that I really needed to reconnect with what motivated me to go back to school in the first place. Which okay. was so the the coffee jolted you and <laughs> and the message you got a message you had a light bulb moment but it was also coffee maybe. it was also <laughs> coffee yes well and so and so this sort of so the idea that like sort of reconnecting with the reason why I wanted to go back to school in the first place sort of brings us back in my life story um, to the time when I was having babies. So this was, you know, would have been several years prior to this. Um, you know, I, so, you know, I, me and my husband, we got married straight out of college. We did the, you know, five years together and then you start planning a baby. And, um, I gave birth to my first daughter in 2009. And, you know, I, I had struggled with, anxiety and depression, sort of my whole, I would say adolescence and teenage years and got placed on medication when I was about 19 and had been taking it. Um, throughout my pregnancy, I had tried to get down to like the lowest dose possible because I thought that's what was best for my baby. And um, so I have this baby and I'm so excited, right? And it, it was just this amazing experience but I was so, so scared. And when they like handed her to me and were like, Hey, you get to go home with her. I was like, no, 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 <laughs> nope, nope. This is a mistake. I am not qualified. Put to her care back for in. This. Somebody put her back in. <laughs> I'm not qualified to care for this living individual. There's been a mistake made, but you know, and so I really did struggle. And of course there's always the struggle of like being a new mom. Like, obviously that's, it, it's, super scary. Like you're like, no, no, that, no, no, I need to stay here where you guys know how to care for my baby. Like, I don't, yeah, I think every mom has, 
every mom has a baseline anxiety of being a new mom and trying to figure it out. And really dads too. I want to include dads that are listening. There, there's a whole learning curve that all new parents go through. And and I don't think it ever stops. But that those first those first few months, I think everyone has an extra layer of anxiety that they didn't have before. Yeah. And so you know, I, I I go home with this baby and I do my maternity live, leave gig. And within a couple, I would say within a couple, you know, weeks, I would say, you know, we struggled with breastfeeding my little one. She wouldn't latch on until 10 days. So I thought, oh my gosh, I'm the worst mother. This child is going to starve to death under my care. This is going to be awful. So, you know, a couple extra stressors on top of just the normal stress. But, you know, within a few weeks, I realized that what I was going through was probably not just like normal hormonal changes and things like that. And so I did reach out to my doctor and, you know, it got diagnosed with postpartum depression and it was pretty intense for a little while there. Um, You know, there's an interesting phenomenon that occurs when you have a baby, but then you have depression because there, there's a societal expectation that you're supposed to be happy when you have a baby. And when you don't necessarily meet that societal expectation, it causes a lot of like guilt and feeling like you're not really that good of a mom. So I really, truly struggled through all that with my first one, but got on medications, got taken care of. And, you know, my husband, I'm sure would probably remember it differently. I think (laughs) not easy to deal with, but, you know, kind of went through all that first, first parent type of stuff. And you know, then we decided a couple years later, hey, let's have a second one. The first one was, she was easy, right? And then, you know, and <laughs> that's how they trick you. That's how they trick you. They're super sneaky that way. Um, but so we got pregnant really quickly. And I can like vividly recall this instant where, like, I was telling my, like, I'm like, we're pregnant again. And we both sat on the like guest room bed and we we're like, what have we gotten ourselves into? <laughs> like, it was like we were excited, but yeah, this one's still little and needs a lot of care. And so, you know, went through that pregnancy and I kind of did the same sort of like song and dance as I did with the first pregnancy, tried to stay on a really low dose of medications because I just thought, gosh, that's what's best for my baby, which I'll explain later is actually not the current theory. Um, (laughs) I was going to say, I upped my dose of Zoloft when I was pregnant. That's kind of what you're supposed to do. But, you know, back, you know, this was not something that in a small town I was receiving much information about. Um, My OBGYN was not really that comfortable with prescribing my medication, but he did because he's like, well, I don't want you to go off it. So, um, got pregnant with a second one. I had a really difficult pregnancy. I actually went into preterm labor um, well, with both of my kids, but with the second one at about 24 weeks. Oh and my so, God. Yeah. So I had to be on like do the bed rest thing and then had to do like injections and pills and all sorts of stuff. And, you know, you go into the second one where you're, you know, you're a little bit more aware of the fact, okay, so like I could have postpartum depression, like that's a thing that could happen. Yeah. And kind of more aware of the fact that, okay, I need to, I need to keep an eye out for this. So I had my second one and, um, you know, labor went great. She latched right on. So I was like super excited. I'm like, I'm going to kill this mom thing this time. Like I am so experienced. (laughs) Um, and then she actually ended up in the hospital when she was three days old. She had, um, meningitis. Oh my God. We didn't actually know that at the time. Um, but so it was kind of a, the the first like week to 10 days was kind of a whirlwind in that we were checked into the hospital in this small town. A day later, they're like, Hey, we need to life flight her into the bigger town because we don't, and we need to put her in the ICU because we don't know what's going on. And so you know, here I am. I'm, I'm, I'm hysterical, obviously, because that's what, yeah, you know. And I don't know if being a nurse made that worse or better because I, I, I felt as a nurse, I knew too much about what was going on and that made my anxiety worse in you know, the situations that I've been in. It's kind of interesting because I think a lot, in a lot of ways, I knew, I knew what was going on. But my husband 
I, you know, he has, he has since admitted to me, he's like, I thought she was going to die. Like I thought our baby was going to die. And at some level, I didn't even let myself think that. So it was surprising to me to like hear that from him because like, I just wouldn't let myself go there. Like I knew that was a thing, but for whatever reason, like I, I looked at like the data and I looked at the labs and I looked at what was going on and for some reason it didn't add up to that to me, you know? Um, So maybe it was reassuring for you that you had this nursing background that you could interpret things differently. You know, I think, I think it did help um, at some level because, you know, I was able to kind of look at it a little bit, you know, look at the data as opposed to just being told like, Hey, your three-year-old or three-day-old baby possibly has meningitis or necrotizing enterocolitis, but we've got a life flighter anyway. So, um, So, you know, we get to the ICU or the PICU and, you know, they're, you know, they take care of her. They end up like discharging us after she's like eight or nine days old. And as they're discharging us, they're like, oh, did they tell you the results of that spinal tap? And I'm like, well, no. And they're like, oh, well, it turns out she has viral meningitis. And I'm like, so why are you letting me leave? That's not okay. But they can't really do anything for viral meningitis. So, I mean, we ended up leaving that day with a baby who had viral meningitis and pneumonia and tell them telling us, okay, well, good luck. And you've got this other little baby at home, like not baby, but a small child at home. Well, and it turns out that she was real angry um, oh. with, with us because I mean, what ended I'm up the oldest. I know how that feels. <laughs> right. You know, at some level I was like, all right, I'm, I'm like 10 days in, like I haven't gotten depressed. I feel like I've held it together as much as a mom who has a, an infant in the PICU can hold it together. Right. And I'm like, I've totally, like, I'm totally not going to have this depression thing this time that I've, I've got it kicked. And I didn't. Um, we ended up getting home and my older one was, got sick. Like, Um, which turned out to be croup, but we didn't know it at the time, but I just knew she was sick and I needed to keep her away from my baby. So I was holed up in my bedroom with this infant and like having to listen to my two and a half year old crying outside the door. And I like legitimately lost it. I went downstairs to my husband and I'm like, I got to go. I need to leave. And I ended up taking the baby and going to my parents' house in Minnesota and staying there for like two weeks because I just couldn't. Like I couldn't handle that guilt of having a sick, having a baby who was just in the PICU and then having a sick child that I can't like, I can't be around you. And so I I went, my husband, who is just such a wonderful man, had to end up taking several weeks off work then after that because he had to take care of our our oldest who was ill and home. Um, And so God bless him. He, he really has, he really was just such a support because I mean, when you have a new baby, you don't expect to have to take care of your wife. And so that was, um, that was an experience, but he basically said to me, he's like, I, it's okay if you go, but you need to go to the doctor first. You need to, you know, make sure the baby's okay. You need to like talk, talk to them about what's going on with you and then you can go. So I went to, um, I went and took the baby in for a weight check and kind of told the pediatrician what was going on with me. And she's like, well, you know, um, if you have to increase your medications anymore, then I'm not going to, I'm not going to want you to breastfeed. And I feel well, right. So I had, a, I can, I can recall it like it was yesterday because there was a very definite moment at which it was, well, it's either her or it's you. And wait, 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 unpack that for a second. So you had a moment in the pediatrician's office? Yeah. I mean, it was, she made it pretty clear that it was either my health or the baby's health. It was one of the two, but it couldn't be both because like, if I had- Like she, she would only treat? No. So, I mean, she basically, the pediatrician said to me, I understand kind of what you're going through, but if your doctor increases your medications at all, I don't want you to breastfeed. And you were doing so well at breastfeeding. I was. We were kicking butt at that. Um, so like I said, I had, I I had a very definitive moment of feeling like, well, it's either her or it's me. And, and, you know, already feeling like a terrible mother because of everything that's going on. I'm like, well, I'll just tough it out. 
And, um, you know, and, and I have, I have, I have a lot of feelings about that moment in the pediatrician's office, because after now having gone into this field myself, I know that that's not accurate. I know that what she told me wasn't true. And the, and, and the most frustrating part about it was the, the information was there at that time. Like I go back, you know, I do tons of research on pregnancy and medications and all of this stuff. And these articles are from 2005, you know, 2010. So the information was there. It's just that nobody bothered to, you know, prioritize my health. Right. Nobody cares about moms once they've delivered the baby. You're just a baby making machine, right? Thanks Republicans. (laughs) Um, What? Sorry. (laughs) Hang on. Wait a second. Okay. So you had this defining moment in the pediatrician's office, you decide I'm not going to take more medication because I have to breastfeed my baby. I have to take care of my baby. I have to be this mom. And then you did end up going to your parents after that. I did. I did. And, um, it was, it was great because it was sort of just a reset. My mom took care of me, you know, they helped out with the baby. And by the time that I got back, you know, I felt a lot better and was able to sort of, you know, cope with life. But that, experience, I would say probably the defining moment of when I when I knew that I had to go and I had to help other women who were in this situation. Okay. And so when you were taking a gap year before going back to school, um, you were reflecting back on all of this, I'm guessing. And you're like, I have to go for my psych NP. Um because of that experience. Exactly. It, it, you know, like I said, with that quote, it was, you know, I didn't know at all what my purpose in life was. I didn't know what all of these experiences were supposed to be telling me, but I knew what my passion was. And my passion was that I did not want any other woman to feel the way that I felt that day in the pediatrician's office. So now that we know your training and your passion, can you tell me what is a normal day at work look like for you? So a normal day at work is like not ever normal. I mean, it, it, when you're working <laughs> in psychiatry, it, it, you can get any variety of day. Um, so my practice is not fully perinatal psychiatry because they're just, I mean, there aren't enough women who are pregnant to kind of support a practice. Um, right now I have about 600 patients on my caseload. I have a lot of pregnant women. Um, I have a lot of women of childbearing age, and I do tend to see more women than I do men. And um, a normal day is, you know, I get to the clinic and I see patients um, for rechecks, which are 30 minute appointments. Um, I do intakes for new patients, um, which are hour long appointments. You know, what's specific to me and sort of my, my perinatal practice is that I do keep time in my schedule for like for anybody who is pregnant, who needs to get in someone who's postpartum that needs to get in because those things can't wait like three months, which is what my normal, you know, my normal wait time would be. So I do kind of carve out time for that within my schedule. And then also I do um, a lot of collaboration with obstetricians. Um, They'll call me and say, Hey, I've got this patient. They, you know, that I want you to see, but I, I'd like to get them started on something. What can I give them? So you are the specialist in this situation. Yeah. And it's an interesting feeling because I, I mean, I really appreciate the trust that they put on, in me to take care of their patients. And I think that like through collaboration, I were able to get people like very well, much quicker um, I'll give just like a short example. I had a I had an obstetrician call me um, the other day, and she's like, "Hey, I've got this gal. She's 25 weeks pregnant, and she is like, she's suicidal. She's having a lot of trouble. She has a history of bipolar. What do I do?" And I mm-hmm. said, "All right, well, you know, I want you to prescribe this medication. I want you to do it in this dose, but I ha- but you're okay to go up all the way to this dose um, if it doesn't work." And so she, she's like, cool, I'll do that. I'm going to schedule her in your women's health spot. So I was able to see her within the next week. But, but the, the amazing thing about that collaboration was that this, this patient, so she started out suicidal. She started around this dose of medication that I said to start on. And then the patient actually called in about a week later and said, really, things are not better. I'm still really having these thoughts. And the OB was like, okay, well, we're going to increase it. Like I had told her she could, 
okay. to a dose that would not have been comfortable for an OBGYN to prescribe, but she did. And then by the time that I saw her, she's like, I'm doing so well. Oh, good. And so good. that collaboration led to like a significantly improved patient outcome because, you know, I, I was able to empower the obstetrician to say, I know this isn't your area of expertise, but this is what you can do. And so she did something that was probably way out of her comfort range, but she knew she had me to back her up. Yeah. It ended up with somebody who's pregnant and now she's doing so fantastic. She's Aww. like, I've not felt this good in years. And so it really is just amazing what you can do with that type of collaboration. Okay. So that's a day in the life as a psych NP. Um, what I'm wondering is, do you see your work highlighted in the media? Oh, no. Not, I mean... The only time <laughs> oh, that I, no. the only time that I would see like psych in the media is when somebody who has a mental health issue does something terrible, which I think is unfortunate because people with mental health issues, I mean, there's statistics to prove that they're far more likely to hurt themselves than anybody else. Um, but I think that that's where you see a lot of psychiatry in the media is um, people who have been diagnosed with a certain mental health issue and then they go on to have a crime or do something that's, you know, that's not good. The field that I'm in, I would say is predominantly male um, providers. So these are like psychiatrists. And, you know, I think I think we're, you know, psychiatry in general and psychiatrists in specific are kind of looked at as kind of stuffy and, you know, kind of real, you know, this really well educated, you know, not real super great bedside manner for the most part. And so I try to sort of break the mold of that. Yeah, yeah. Try to just sort of meet my patients at like a human level. It sounds like you get a lot of joy and a lot of fulfillment from the work that you're doing. But I can't, I just, I can't imagine that it's all easy. So what is the most challenging part of your job? That would easily be the fact that people wait too long to come to psychiatry. But I will say that my one really big pet peeve is the primary care providers that start their patients on Xanax and then send them to me to get them off. Oh, no. Yeah, so this is like my public service announcement to all <laughs> primary care providers or any type of or or patients like like okay so Xanax so anyone that's listening Xanax is a benzodiazepine it is an addictive substance and so your body will become accustomed to it and eventually need more and it's just a quick fix it's supposed to be for like an acute crisis not for daily dosing and um it sounds like you've worked with some PCPs that are a little outdated on prescription practices around that <laughs> they get a little loose with the xanax i'll give you that yeah oh well my god and so my opinion with xanax is essentially that it it needs to be in an emergency room and that's that's about it so yeah, um, yeah. i don't really prescribe it and but it is difficult to get people off because it is just so um it, it's not only psycho it's not only physically addictive it's also psychologically addictive people right i'm gonna need this i'm gonna need this so i i can't not have a prescription for this because i'm gonna need it. it it's really it really is a double-edged sword in that sense and 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 i do understand like i said the sort of the role that primary care providers are being put in like they don't have more than probably like a week or two of residency in psych, you know, like while they're doing mm -hmm. their training. And so mm -hmm. I, I understand the position they're being put in. Um, and, and when you give people Xanax, they don't call back and bother. Them. Right. They're, they're doped up. But I, I'd also, I'd also apply that to many other benzodiazepines. Agreed. You know, clonazepam has a long half-life. Ativan, a lot of people have Ativan for that immediate anxiety or panic attack. Um, some people have it for a seizure dis disorder. If they were to have a seizure, they have Ativan available. Um, and that's like maybe one reason to have it on an outpatient basis right. on a long-term prescription is if you need it to have, you know, before you have a seizure. Um, so I, I really can't think of any other reason that anyone should have a long-term prescription for a benzodiazepine. Um, and we are not giving out healthcare advice. We're kind of on a soapbox right now. We are, we're complaining that people shouldn't have these prescriptions and they do. And then by the time they get to Anne, she's having to have tough discussions about, hey, you're addicted to this substance and we're going to have to wean you off of it. Yeah, it, it is, it is tr challenging too. And it puts, I mean, 
it's part of my job. So it's sort of something that I, that I sort of accept at some level, but it does, it does make it so that you're not always people's favorite person. Right. And then what, what is the best part of your gig? The absolute, I mean, hands down, the best part is seeing people get better. You know, because the relationship that I have with people is long-term, um, most of these people have to see me you know, for, for long-term management of medications is just the, is just seeing people get better. I'll, I'll throw in a patient story here for you just cause I have a few, you know, but I had a patient who she had been seeing her OBGYN that day. She was three days postpartum and had seen her OBGYN that's across the hall from me because she was having significant depression, right? So they call over to my office and they say, is there any way that she can see her? Well, I had like just a random opening that day. And I'm like, absolutely. You know, like, um, of course I'll see her. And this poor girl comes in with her husband who looks terrified and this baby that's the size of like a large squash. Oh. <laughs> I mean, like, I mean, so it's just like, and it's so raw and it's so new. And she is just beside herself oh just being able because I mean as you know and probably a lot of your listeners know my medications are not going to work quick you know right. antidepressants take a solid four to six weeks to get in your system and become effective so a big part of what I do is sort of just instill hope I try to explain to people that things are going to get better I'm going to I'm going to work with you I'm going to work for you and this is not how it's going to be forever because people in this like deep, dark place, they don't see tomorrow as being a good day. They don't see, I mean, they don't see the next hour as being something they can survive. So this girl came in and like I said, just very, very emotional and just really struggling. She'd had like three other pregnancies that had gone just fine. She just really had a difficult time. And so got her on some medications, made some adjustments in the meantime. And I saw her back six weeks later and she just looked me straight in the eyes and said, I wouldn't be here if you wouldn't have seen me that day. Wow. And I mean, by far, that's that's why I do it. I mean, 100%. I'm just going to sit with that for a second. That's so important. I, yeah. So with with a lot of, it sounds like you pour a lot of heart and emotion into your work. And I think that you are going to need to recharge. And I, I don't know where you get your energy from. Like I said before, folks, this is just Anne. She's full of energy, but how do you recharge and take care of yourself, especially when you see some really hard things? And it, I would imagine that the hard things that you see remind you of the hard things you've been through. Yeah. So, I mean, it is, I mean, it does remind me of that. And what I'm fortunate is that I'm sort of on the other side of that, right? Like I've got kids that I've got two girls, they're 10 and they're seven, you know, like they can kind of take care of themselves. And so, I mean, I can see it from the other side now. And so I do appreciate that. That's a lot. I get a lot of perspective and I, and, and it, it's really nice that way, you know, as far as, yeah, I mean, the things that I hear, um, are difficult. Um, I, and, you know, I think something that sort of is helpful in psychiatry is to be able to sort of put things into a box and leave them at work. And I really do try to do that as much as I can. The depths of human suffering that you hear about, I mean, they're unmeasured. And, and so I do have to, at some level, be able to sort of set that aside and then, and then kind of go back home and live my life. And, I've, and I think my personality lends to that because even in nursing, you know, I was able to do that. I was able to grieve and cry with a family who lost their loved one but then be able to go back to my family and then be, but be very, very grateful. So like I said, personally, I've just been decent at doing that. I know some, I don't have that personality. I actually really struggled with that. I, I would struggle seeing something or feeling something with that patient and that family and then going home and still feeling that way and not being able to disconnect. Um, so it sounds like you just have a great personality for, for doing this work. And then I know you're a runner. I am. I'm a very slow and sad runner. I probably look like I'm about to die. <laughs> so exercise is part of your regimen. 
to take care of yourself. And you're not the only one that says that. So a lot of a lot of people that come on the show have said that that's something that really clears their mind. You know, my family, we're really involved in church too. So that's another, we have a really super supportive, you know, faith life and a, and a faith family that, and we're, we're so lucky to have that. And so that's another huge part of sort of my self-care is just kind of that reconnecting community. that way. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Anne, thank you for being so vulnerable and sharing what it was like to have postpartum depression and then um, the important work that you're doing in this area. I think that we need to elevate work like this because, I mean, the whole psych industry is underfunded, underserved. There's not enough people to do the work that you're doing. And those patients are often forgotten or not valued as normal people and they should be. And so I think it's great for you to share that. And if people want to reach out to you, how, how could they do that? You know, I would love it if you would be able to just sort of field that for me through your email. Um, Yeah. All right. So if anyone wants to get a hold of Anne or ask her questions, just go ahead and email me at hello at doseofsupport.com or reach out to me on Instagram or in the Facebook group if you want to connect with her directly or if you have questions for her. I was just going to say that I do have resources like like in multiple states. Um, and I have some specific resources in Minnesota. Um, so that is, if somebody ha- has questions or they're looking for resources, I'm just more than happy. You know, if you're postpartum, you're pregnant, you're, you know, childbearing, or you're just thinking about it and you have questions or, you know, you need support or need somebody um, that you can need, need a reference to um, someplace that you can go. I have a lot of references, so I'm more than happy to provide those for anyone who needs them. That's awesome. Thanks for that. Um, All right, listeners, you know what to do. Share our show, rate and review. Make sure you're subscribed so that you don't miss a show. Thank you, Ann Hofer, for being here, our psych NP, and we'll see you all next week. Every role in healthcare is important, and these experiences matter. We'll be back next week with a brand new guest and a whole different story. Until then, make connections, you guys. Give each other a dose of support. Dose of Support is written, produced, and edited by me, Vanessa Casper, with exclusive music by Rafael Sequeira. Don't forget to rate the show, write a review, and leave feedback wherever you listen. I'm punching out until next week, where we try to find some self-care in healthcare once again.